This is a speech in which FDR has felt his hands were being tied because he wants to help whom? This is in 1940. Who's in a lot of trouble in 1940? England. England. Yes, he wants to help England. And uh, is the United States ready to jump into war again? No, we are not ready to do that. There are very strong political forces and parties and candidates who argue against doing that. It's not clear that the American people really want to do it. So Roosevelt decides that he will try what gambit? He will not go to war. He can't ask for that. He asked for that only after the attack on Pearl Harbor, which is almost a year later. But he will instead say that Congress should offer England what? Well, not just financial support, but yeah, material support. Material support. Lend lease. You can pay us back later. That's the idea. You can pay us back later. Because there was a law that actually would prevent them from saying, well, you know, you have to do it now. I forget the head note here mentioned something about what was it? The Johnson Act of 1934 prohibited loans to governments that were in default, and Britain was nearly in default. So therefore, you weren't supposed to loan anything to Britain financially. But FDR proposes that we send material, that the United States send material. And he begins this and says to Congress, I address you, members of this new Congress, at a moment unprecedented in the history of the Union. Unprecedented because at no other time has American security been as seriously threatened from without as it is today. Now, this is a very special, he's building up to a very special kind of evidence. I suppose that every realist knows that the democratic way of life is at this moment being directly assailed in every part of the world. So here we are again. What is he referring to? What action is he referring to? Beginning of 1940, what has been happening? Like Mussolini is in Italy. Um Hitler is in Germany, these dictatorships. Well, where else is Hitler's armies? Oh, ev everywhere. Oh, yeah, throughout much, Europe. throughout much of Europe. Throughout much of Europe. Yes, throughout much of Europe. And um, Have and they attacked Poland, for example? Yes. Yes, they've attacked Poland. Have they attacked other countries? Yes. Yes. So all of this has happened. And all of this happened after supposedly Germany said that it was satisfied with, say, the Sudetenland or certain things. Philip? I would also note that he uses the word realist in terms of like referring to the opposite of what Wilson was. So Wilson was the idealist. Maybe. I'm not sure he's intentionally going after Wilson here as much as he is saying, we have to examine what is really going on in the world today. And what is going on in the world today is that democracy is under threat. And is the United States a democracy? Yes. That's the nth meme. What's the conclusion? The US is under threat. Now, it's not exactly a valid syllogism unless you consider that all democracies are connected one to another. So the implication is that they are connected one to another. And now we're back to the theme that Wilson used, that the freedom of one nation or the democratic process of one nation, one place, is absolutely connected to the democratic process of any nation, any place. This is what we call solidarity. This is what is the history, so, as it is often said, that the leader of the United States is the leader of the free world, whether one believes that or not. The idea is that the United States is going to represent itself as the protector and helper of other democracies, of people who are free anywhere. That that is a role the United States will play. Now, of course, an argument against that is we can't be the policeman of the entire world. It's just not going to work. We can't get involved in fights everywhere. So there's an argument, say, for not invading Iraq. Iraq didn't have a democratic government. Well, let it alone. Don't invade it. Did it threaten democracy? You could say it did. But are you going to try to go into every dictatorship in the world with military force? That's a stunning thing to say, a remarkable thing to say. People are then going to turn around to you and say, we've been minding our business within our own borders, and now you come in. That becomes a problem. So he says, our national policy is this, at the bottom of page 121. What topic then follows? Our national policy is this. This is a pretty easy one. Yeah, definition and 
What often goes with definition as subparts under it? First, second, third, fourth? No, well, not really. Uh, it got a D here, though. I don't have it written here. Yep, you got it right there. Yep, he's got it. Division, yeah. division, yes, it's division. And this is one of the great speeches to show division because he says this is our policy, first, second, third, fourth. And then there's another great use of division in this speech in which he turns, in this the speech has a marvelous turn to it. And on page 123, he says, what do you expect out of a democracy? Well, you ought to expect certain essential things. And they ought to be something that everyone in any democracy has, not just in the United States. He says, in the future days which we seek to make secure, we look forward to a, not a country, to a world, a world founded upon four essential freedoms. So here is that interesting identification once again of not just the United States, but an attempt for the United States, however you judge it, to speak for people elsewhere. You can say, no, I don't want the US to do that. But that is what Roosevelt is doing, in part because what is his object? To help people elsewhere, to get that material to people in Britain. A lot of people thought Britain was going to go under. Joe Kennedy, who was JFK's father, thought Britain was going to lose. He said so. It's one of the reasons why he lost his ambassadorship to England. Believe it or not, true. Joe Kennedy thought England had just about had it. It's interesting that John Kennedy, when he was at Harvard, wrote his senior thesis that later became a book called While England Slept, about the fact that England did not see the buildup that Germany was making, did not address it sufficiently as a deterrent. So he certainly ended up not agreeing with what his father had said. But Roosevelt wants to try to speak for all of those people and then these great four essential freedoms, freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world, everywhere in the world. Second, freedom of every person to worship God in his own way, everywhere in the world. The third is freedom from want. <coughs> what does want mean here? It's an older use of the word. We usually don't use it that way today. Freedom from want. What does that mean? Yes, need. Here, want means need. Here, it really comes close to meaning poverty. That you cannot supply yourself the basic necessities of life. And the fourth is freedom from fear, which translated into world terms means a worldwide reduction of armaments to such a point and in such a thorough manner that no nation will be in a position to commit an act of physical aggression against any neighbor anywhere in the world. And then a little later on in this speech, Roosevelt lays out the first vision of what will later become known as the post-World War II world order, which we now see under a great deal of stress but Roosevelt himself calls it the world order we seek is the cooperation of free countries working together in a friendly, civilized way. It's called multilateralism. It's called cooperation. It's called democracies banding together. John Kennedy goes to Berlin to give a speech not long after the Berlin Wall goes up. Let's do a little history. Berlin is in the middle of Germany exactly? Where? No. Yeah, it's sort of more in the northeast. So Germany gets divided after the war into east and west Germany. It isn't just east and west, it's divided by the four great powers, the United States, Britain, France, and Russia. Germany's divided, though, in effect, into two, because Britain, the United States, and France say, look, we're just going to have one west Germany. East Germany, dominated by Russia and then the German Communist Party. Berlin is divided into how many sectors? Four, yes. But you can pass easily from the French sector to the British sector to the US sector. And then there's another sector, which is the East German or Russian sector. OK? So how did people get into Berlin from West Germany? No, how, do you, how did people get in to Berlin 
plain, yes, and train and roads. There were designated roads, there were designated train lines, and there were designated air corridors so people from the west could get to West Berlin and people from West Berlin could get back to the west. Okay? What happens in the late 1940s? The Soviet Union blockaded East Berlin from the, sorry, West Berlin from the West Germany. Yes. And then Truman had the airlift. Yes. Yes, in other words, the trains were shut down and the roads were shut down. You know, that's kind of easy to do if you've got a lot of big tanks. It's not, you know, easy to argue with those. But what happened, you said? How did the communication stay alive? Uh, the airlift. The airlift. There was a huge airlift. The entire city of West Berlin was supported for a period of time by nothing but airplanes flying in and out of Tempelhof, Tegel Airport, they just would fly in, plane after plane after plane. Why would you do that? To keep West Berlin going. Otherwise, what would happen to it? Come on, let's be realists here. What would happen? People would have starved. Yeah, people would have starved, or eventually, you turn the tourniquet tightly enough and it becomes Russian. You don't have a government left, you have chaos. You know, you can't even supply your own troops. Or you say, oh my god, we're going to have to go to war. We'll have to go to war to do something. We're really going to have to fight. So this airlift goes on and on and on, and finally it succeeds. The Berlin airlift succeeds. I think it's 1948. So now it's all, not all that many years later. Here we are. East Germany has just been put, put up that wall, the Berlin Wall. Remember when Reagan later goes to Berlin and says, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, and in 1989, it actually comes down? But in 1961, 62, it's just going up. And John Kennedy goes to Berlin, and he gives this amazing speech. It's apparently composed the night before. As your head note indicates to you, there was another longer, more boring speech that he was going to give. And he let someone read it, one of his advisors read it. And he said, well, you know, what do you think? And he was told, uh, not, not so good. Not a good speech. So <clears throat> that's the screws are on sometimes <laughs> when you have to write a good speech. There he is. Now, his speech was considered so volatile by the West German government that they would not broadcast it from beginning to end. They thought it might cause a riot. And if you see the films of this address, which I think you can see on YouTube, it's cut up into parts because there's no one continuous filming of it. It was not permitted. It was thought to, it would incite the people too much. So Kennedy comes and he gives this famous address, which he begins, I am proud to come to this city as the guest of your distinguished mayor, who has symbolized throughout the world the fighting spirit of West Berlin, and to visit the Federal Republic with your distinguished chancellor. He's referring to Willy Brandt and Conrad Adenauer there. Then he says, 2,000 years ago, the proudest boast was Kiwis Romanus Sum, which means, all of you who read this and looked up the Latin, Kiwis Romanus Sum, Yes, I'm a Roman. I'm a citizen of Rome. I have all the rights and privileges of being a citizen of Rome. Now, being a citizen of Rome was a big deal because Rome went all the way from the middle of the British Isles to the sands of Arabia and northern Africa and all the way up into Germania. The Roman Empire was huge, and as a citizen of Rome, you had real rights and privileges. No matter where you came from, no matter what color your skin was, if you were a Roman citizen, it meant something. Kennedy says, there are many people in the world who really don't understand or say they don't that the great issue between the free world and the communist world, let them come to Berlin. In other words, this is where the rubber meets the road. This place exemplifies something important. And what it exemplifies, among other things, is a solidarity of people who want to be free with other people who are free and their willingness to join together to assure that. At the top of the next page, uh, your, I'm afraid your poor editor of this book totally butchered the German at the end of that uh, first paragraph at the top. It should be lassen Sie nach Berlin kommen, not las sich or sick nach Berlin kommen. Anyway, let them come to Berlin. 
He then goes on, and the famous tagline of this speech, which you see uh, at the end of this speech, as it's given here, is all free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. Now think about that sentence. All free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, ich bin ein Berliner. Now don't let someone tell you that this is very bad German. You know what this means? What would you normally say as a Berliner? You'd normally say, ich bin Berliner, or ich bin Amerikaner. And you wouldn't say, ich bin ein Berliner, because what is ein Berliner? Anyone know? A jelly yeah, kind of a jelly pastry, yes. <laughs> so poor Kennedy, his German isn't perfect. But let me suggest this. What this speech does, and it is really remarkable in what it does and the way it does it, is essentially to say, all free men are citizens of Berlin. I am a free man. Therefore, I am a Berliner. And then the reasoning continues on this way. If Berlin is attacked, it's therefore an attack on me. If it's an attack on me, I am an American who happens to lead the American people. Therefore, an attack on Berlin is an attack on the American people and an attack on its leader. That's the message. And that's why the crowd goes bonkers. This is yet again a message of solidarity. You know, it's like that statement by Martin Luther King Jr. that, you know, if, if someone is not free somewhere, it means that everyone is not free everywhere. That in other words, this sense that real human freedom is not divisible, ultimately. Real human freedom is something that must be seen in solidarity. Now that's an ideal. That is an ideal. And that's a very hard thing to work out in practical diplomacy. But what Kennedy is doing here in essence is saying, everything redounds to Berlin. Take Berlin as the example. Could be any place, but Berlin is especially dramatic because it's an island surrounded by a communist state. Now it's got a wall down the middle of it, which the Germans called the anti-fascist prophylactic barrier. That's what they called it. How many people tried to escape from West Berlin to East Berlin? Zero. Zero. In East Berlin, they would let you go to the West under what one condition? A whole number of people they would let go to the West. If, if you were 65 or older, why would they let those people go? That's part of it. What else? Oh, think, think financially. Yeah, they're not working any longer. And in fact, yeah, they're, they're pensioners. You've got to support them. So these Germans would let people who were 65 go back to the West. Anyway, the more you look at this little short speech, the more that you see it is really filled with a series of enthymemes that Kennedy is exploiting to a very large degree.